The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship with Avery United Methodist Church. I'm Jenny Williams. I'm the pastor of the church, and it is good to be together today. If you worshiped with us last week, right at 10 o'clock online, uh, you will acknowledge that what just happened just now is a very snappy beginning to our worship video today. Uh, last week, I uploaded the unedited version of the video in which you got to see my you know, prep time getting into preparing for uh, worship and for speaking. So it just goes to highlight the importance of video editors. Uh, they are not, get, not thanked very often, so we're grateful for uh, Jason who has done our video editing in the past and um, now you just have to suffer with my mistakes on occasion. So anyhow, it's good that we're together today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about a couple of different scriptures. One I want to share with you right now. It's one of my favorites. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, verses 12 through 31a, and it is a um, part of a letter that the Apostle Paul was writing to the faith community at Corinth. And Paul says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaved or, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body doesn't consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members don't need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has pointed in the church First, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and then deeds of power, and then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. Here ends the reading. So this is one of the lectionary passages for today, one of the passages that's appointed. Um, groups of passages are chosen and they're um, assembled into a three-year calendar called the, the one we use is called the Revised Common Lectionary. And so lots of churches all over the place hear these same texts read on the same Sunday. And I'm gonna read um, the, one of the other texts. That one was an epistle, a letter, and this one comes from the Hebrew scriptures. It's from a not very often preached from book of the Bible called Nehemiah. And um, before I enter into that scripture reading, I'm gonna invite us just to take a few moments of uh, deep breath, just to ground and center ourselves, and then I'll pray.
And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, the world's savior. Amen. So I'm going to give you a little context for this passage, uh, because the Hebrew scriptures are a large part of our Bible and a lot is going on. This is post-exile. So all of uh, the Jews, all of God's people had been taken from their land, long story behind that, um, had been exiled for a good while, and now they have returned. And this is taking place in Jerusalem. Um, after the temple has been rebuilt, uh, the exiles have begun to return. And there are two kind of key um, leadership characters in this story. There's Nehemiah, um, who is the governor of that area, and there's Ezra, who is a priest. And so the people are assembling, um, and for the first time in a long, long time in generations, hearing scripture or the law uh, be read. So there are a number of names in this. I'm sure I'll stumble over those. They're not regularly used names, but uh, there's a purpose for reading them. So this is from Nehemiah, just a little bit before the beginning of chapter 8 um, through verse 10, 12. We'll see how far I go. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe, Ezra, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malchijah, Heshum, Hajbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy to our lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the lord is your strength so the levites stilled all the people saying be quiet for this day is holy don't be grieved and all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Here ends the reading. When I was um, in seminary, when I was a young whippersnapper, when I was in seminary, um, I, I dreamed of the day of when I would become a pastor. And one of the dreams that I had was what my business cards would look like. Okay, this was when you still had to do dial-up on the internet. So the world was a very different place. There were uh, very few cell phones being used. So the way that we would convey our professional information to people was with a business card. 
uh, for those children that might need that explained to them. Um, so I dreamed about what my business card would look like, and I imagined the cross and flame of the United Methodist Church, and on that business card, it would have my name and my title, and it would say, Reverend Jennifer C. Williams, and it would have the name of the church below. I often thought about that, that it would mean somehow that I had made it, that I'd done all the work, that I'd uh, been in seminary, that I had uh, gone through the ordination process, and at last I would be able to have a card that said Reverend Jennifer C. Williams. It was something to which I aspired. Also during seminary, um, when we, it was a three-year program, and seniors in the third year were invited to um, preach at chapel, at our chapel services for the Divinity School. And uh, we took our turn, and so the time uh, that I fell into the rotation to preach uh, was on a January week, and these specific passages were assigned. And I remember reading them, and the first time that I read that Nehemiah passage, I was just struck with the role and the responsibility of Ezra, the priest. That Ezra had this responsibility to take this book, the holy book, the book of scriptures, and read it to the people. And it was a, a position, uh, Ezra even stood on a, a platform to do this, kind of above the people. And Ezra was able um, to introduce this holy word into their lives. And so my first pass when I read um, these passages, that's what really jumped out at me. When you read uh, the passages in the lectionary, you're supposed to kind of read them all along with each other. They're, they're working together for a purpose. Sometimes they do that a little more explicitly than other times. But I looked at all of these and I began to get a different sense of this passage from Nehemiah. I get, you get the sense of the people's role in this process. So they're very excited. They're very excited to hear words that they haven't read in a long time. Holy, holy words. And they've all come together. And the place where they're gathered is near something called the Water Gate, okay, a, a um, geographic de designation, kind of a little landmark there. And um, it's interesting that they were gathered at the Water Gate because um, that was not inside the temple. So it was a place where everyone could be gathered. You'll notice that it says in the text, men and women and all who could understand. Everyone could be gathered to hear the reading of scripture. And when you look closer at this passage, there's a phrase, and maybe you caught a little bit of it when I read it, a phrase that appears again and again and again in this passage, and the phrase is, all the people, all the people. As a matter of fact, in the verses that I read, it says all the people nine times in that passage. It says things like, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, and then when, uh, and Ezra was standing above all the people, and when he opened the book, all the people stood up and said, all the people answered, amen, amen. Um, all the people understood the reading. Um, there was this pronouncement to all the people. All the people wept when they heard the reading over and over. All the people, all the people keep showing up in this passage. And the reason that I stumbled through all of those names is because of how many people it took to walk among the gathered people to help them understand what they were hearing. For some of them, they didn't have any context. For some of them, they had just been told some of the stories. And so it took not just Ezra reading the words of scripture, but it took all of these priests to walk among all the people. And it was this big corporate effort, this day of reading, of hearing, of understanding, and then going to rejoice and celebrate with meals that they were going to make enough to share with people who hadn't prepared for a big meal like that or didn't have enough to eat. It's a text that really shows us that um, it takes all the people to be God's people. And the scripture that I read earlier from 1 Corinthians shows us that we each have a role in that. 
probably if you've hung around um, church communities very often you have heard 1 Corinthians 12 and talk about the church as the body of Christ. We talk about having gifts and how those gifts are complementary and we all work together. Um, but there's this, this part that I often say, even when this passage isn't appointed for the day, that talks about um, the weaker members, okay? And um, when it's saying weaker, it's talking about how society or the culture around us, around us views people. And Paul says that in the body, um, no, no one is um, pointless or useless. Everyone has a role and a part. And Paul also says the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the members of the body that we think are less honorable, we should give greater honor to. And the members that are considered less respectable should be given greater respect. Now, when I say this word members, I don't want you to be hearing like member of a church, even though it definitely does apply there. But I want us to think about all the people, all the people that might be participating in the life of a faith community somewhere, everyone having a role, everyone being important, but most importantly, those who are deemed to be unimportant are actually the most important. Paul knows this, this secret bit of wisdom and tries to impart it to us. One time I served a church and there was a, a wonderful man in the church at that time. He was in his mid-60s and um, he had experienced his whole life mental developmental delays. And uh, he was just a, a, a wonderfully joyous person and uh, this is a, an amazing church and he was a part of the life of the church. And sometimes when we were in meetings where we were discerning decisions for the life of the church, um, he would always share. Sometimes it was on topic and sometimes it wasn't. Um, often it was about the Pittsburgh Pirates and uh, he would bring that up in the middle of a discussion and um, it was wonderful to be part of a church community that just saw that as his contribution. But sometimes, sometimes it was spot on. And when that congregation was discerning, um, how often we should celebrate communion together, because it had been a congregation that celebrated once a month, and we were looking at moving to weekly celebration. This man said, well, I just think we should have communion all the time. And everybody just looked and realized that he'd spoken this word of truth. Now, he was someone that was supported by folks in the community, the wider community, but also kind of ridiculed by many folks in the community, but, but we trusted together that he was to be one of the most important members of the congregation. And it was a privilege to be in that church family when they regarded him so lovingly and understood that he had a wisdom that many of us didn't. This is what Paul is saying about the body of Christ. This is what we understand uh, it means to incorporate all the people, to have everybody have a place. So there are people to be um, elevated that are actually um, smooshed down in the world, right? Um, so there are different roles there, ones who would maybe amplify the voices of people who were disrespected or dishonored in the world and those who have this wisdom that they can share with the rest of us. I think it's sometimes hard. Um, sometimes I refer to myself and, and others as these good-hearted people, right? Maybe we have the right impulses and we want to help, but we've been formed by our society to think that we have something to offer and dispense um, to people who don't have those things whether it's equity, um, whether it's respect, whether it's uh, material needs, right? We've been formed to, to see this in terms of a power dynamic. And you might even be saying, well, not me, not me. And the way that we can assess that in ourselves is to think, am I willing to listen to wisdom 
from the people that I think I'm helping? And am I willing to have my helping be shaped by the people who are often the object of my charity? Right? Who are we listening to? Who is directing the efforts for those of us who have resources? Are we determining how those resources are to be distributed? Or are we listening and receiving how those resources are to be distributed? I really want to commend to you an article, if you follow me on Facebook, I just posted it, um, an article uh, in Mother Jones written by someone who formerly experienced homelessness. It's a, it's a long one. I, I invite you to make the time to sit and read it where she um, explains some of her experiences when she was unsheltered. Um, there is a, a fair amount of content in there that could be troubling. So if you go to that um, article, just be, be warned that there are a number of things there that are very, very difficult to read. Um, it highlights um, kind of the, the cultural and societal way that we're, we have been formed over the last four decades or so to think about people who are unhoused in ways that we may not even recognize how we're being formed. Um, it also just shows the repeated indignities that are um, imposed on people who don't have their material needs yet regularly met and particularly those who are experiencing houselessness. This is of course on my mind because of the work that we've been doing together over the month of January to make sure that folks who are unhoused in Morgantown have shelter there are various options for that, and I want to thank those of you who participated um, in the recent week by donating to our emergency fund. We were able to have um, five hotel rooms for two different nights to put up people who were unhoused through that uh, storm that we just recently had. And we're partnering with another church to be able to do that for a couple more nights here during um, the lows that are coming. This is being recorded on a Thursday, so the next couple nights are supposed to be um, pretty low um, temperatures. Even though when we do that, um, we are coming up with a solution. We're coming up with a solution due to um, necessity to act quickly. But a component of people who are working on these sort of band-aid solutions are also gathering together folks who are currently experiencing houselessness to um, to have them tell those of us who are good-hearted and wish to help, to have them direct us um, so that we're not just developing what we think is good, which in many cases is not appropriate, helpful, or in, um, recognizing the dignity in people who are unhoused. Um, we just need to be listening, and we need to take our cues from Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 to understand that it's, and from Nehemiah, to understand that it's not me up here coming up with an idea or resources, and by me, I, don't, I, I mean me, but I also mean all, all of us who have homes, right? That we have ideas and we're gonna fix it and we're gonna solve it and it's not a quick fix. And the only way to be understanding um, what could best help is to hear it from the people that we try to help. Our job isn't to keep running the systems of help or charity, believe it or not. In lots of ways, our job is to dismantle the systems that do not elevate those who don't have their material needs met. Those systems that I'm talking about are small and informal and sometimes formalized but it involves us examining ourselves, us being quiet enough, us listening, us putting our own pride and our own sense of accomplishment or our own resumes behind us to say, what we want isn't important. What makes us feel good as givers or as doers is not important. What is most important is those who seem to be um, the weakest in the way that the world describes them and to understand that those folks have a wisdom that's been hard won 
and has come from lived experience that none of the rest of us have. So as we go into this next week, I'd really encourage you to read that article. Um, if you're not on Facebook, you can still access it. Um, if you need to contact me, if you need help with that, then just contact me and let me know how. Um, you can contact me through our webpage, which is averyumcwv.org, or you can just search Avery United Methodist in Morgantown. For those of us who are kind of to circle back to these scriptures, we can definitely hear this scripture from 1 Corinthians as talking about the church. It's talking about the body of Christ in the world. And we ought to be embodying these principles really well to be able to, um, to, be, able to uh, be, be a witness to that kind of humility um, in the world. But we also take those same principles and we apply them to places that aren't the church and recognize that people who aren't in the church, um, people who don't believe, right, um, also can be wrapped up in these principles um, in a way that ultimately is pleasing to God. So I hope that you'll join with me in prayer and a time of reflection um, and go forth hearing this scripture differently and understanding and discerning what our role is among all the people. Let us pray. God, you've given us many good gifts, different from one another. And sometimes we fail to see those gifts um, when they don't come along with training or education or honed abilities. And we confess sometimes that those are the kinds of standards that we have for people in the world. So help open our eyes to things like lived experience and conversation, to see those as equally valid as any kind of training or formation that we've received. Help bridge the gap so that we don't live in communities where there's an us and a them and where we're part of perpetuating that language because the language reflects a truth of a division that we'd really rather not be there, but admittedly sometimes don't know how to break down. So help us come to you humbly and with the vulnerability of knowing that we're often wrong, even when we don't recognize it in the moment. Help us to listen, to hear, and to give you honor and glory in our action. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray when we were gathered, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Peace be with you.